seating. I'm going to ask you if you just take your sister and brother by the hand while they're still playing that softly. And we're just going to pray because the entrance of his word giveth life. And we thank God for all of the word that has preceded the spoken word. We thank you for the word of God sung, presented. We thank God for the word of God and the lives of these young ladies, these debutantes, the commitments. We thank God for the praise and the worship. But let's ask God, speak to my heart. Come on, shall we? Every head bow and every eye close. Father, most definitely we've heard your voice in this place. We felt your manifestation in this place. God, we have seen your mighty hand released in this place. And we thank you. We thank you because you've brought us, you've blessed us, you've kept us. You've led us, God. We thank you because you've had mercy on us and blotted out our transgressions and removed iniquity. We thank you, God, because you've been faithful and wonderful. And God, we thank you because you're a mighty savior and a strong tower. You've been a shelter for us, a mother for us, a father for us. You've been a confidant, a constant friend. You've been a lover to our souls. You've been a comforter. Lord God, you've been the lifter of our head. Father, you've been bread on our table. God, you've opened doors and ways and kept back devils and demons. And God, you've healed our bodies, delivered our souls. You've cast out our demons and straightened out our minds. You've washed us and cleansed us and sanctified us and purged us and justified us. Father, we thank you. We thank you in this house. We thank you in this house. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you, we thank you here. We thank you here in this place. We thank you for the vision that we see, the visions we experience. We thank you for the evolution in this house. We thank you for the maturation. We thank you for speaking a word and seeing it come to pass. And we thank you, God. But Alasha, you say a thing and you do the thing you say. You're faithful and consistent and constant and thorough and right and righteous. And oh God, we just thank you in this house. We thank you, Dilabashora. We thank you, Dasayo Korobasi. We thank you here. We thank you for crushing devils and crushing enemies and casting out sicknesses bringing down strongholds we thank you in this house tonight we thank you in this conference we thank you for healing wounds and healing bruises and straightening out our thinking and straightening out our thoughts and touching our hearts and making them soft instead of hard father we thank you in this house we're gonna leave in this place victory we're gonna leave here better for coming we're gonna leave here blessed we're blessed right where we're standing now we thank you in this house oh master Hilarico, stretch out your hand stretch it out stretch out your hand put us under an open window let's send a clear a clear crystallized word so we cannot err so we can't miss it so we cannot pick it up father make it clear <laughs> validate validate the darkness Loose in this house. Everything that Satan bound up, loose it in this Everywhere the devil is, loose in this house. He's not wanted. He's an uninvited trespasser. We cast him out. We cast him out. We cast him out of the minds. Cast him out of the spirit. Cast him out. Cast him out of our finance, cast him out of our homes, cast him off our jobs, cast him away from our children in the name of Jesus. Hey, hey, ah, hey, Jesus. Da, 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 da.
Have your way, sit, 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 sit on your throne. Reign conqueror, 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 your conqueror, conquer, conquer, conquer. In the name of the Lord Jesus, stretch out your hand here. And then, and then you have your way in this house so much the more. Father, we thank you for the anointing. We thank you for the blessed anointing. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the tabasha. We thank you for the anointing. We thank you for it right now. In Jesus' name. Can we say amen? Before you sit down, touch someone, put your arms around them and say, God is a great and a mighty God, and he's here for you. Come on, come on, come on. Say, he's a great and a mighty God, and he's here for you. He's a great and a mighty God, and he's here for you. Woman, will you get another woman and just say, woman to woman. He's here. Huh? Give us some inside information. Just say, woman to woman. He's here. Now tell them who you're talking about. Just tell them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Da, da, ba, ka, yeah. Oh. He's a wonderful savior. He's a wonderful savior and we thank him. And what a privilege and an honor to be here where the Spirit of the Lord is. We thank God because he is faithful and we already know he's faithful in this house. And we thank God for this is wonderful. This is magnanimous. This is beautiful. I thank God for the vision here in this house. Thank God for your bishop and pastor uh, and one of God's mighty men of valor preaching the gospel to all of the body of Jesus Christ. We thank God for this anointing that he's placed upon him for this season, this time in the body of Jesus Christ. And he's doing a phenomenal job, a phenomenal job. And we thank God for him. He's doing a phenomenal job. Our hearts are proud. Our hearts are proud of him. And I'm just glad because <clears throat> he reaches beyond every every line, every circumference, everywhere there was a barrier, he's been past it. And I thank God for it. Can we say amen for what God is doing in our generation? And what other woman could have been on his side? Thank God, God makes good choices. <laughs> thank God for this very fine, beautiful, statuesque, graceful, elegant, Christ-like, so polished and poised, our very fine first lady of this conference, woman to woman, Miss Sarita Jakes. Is God good? Save, sanctify, a teacher and speaker and intercessor in her own right. And we thank God for her. We thank God for her. Um, we're just proud as ladies to know that someone can carry that kind of grace regardless to the times, the struggles, or whatever God is calling for. She's just classy, and she's touchable, she's reachable, and God has appointed her the woman for the hour. So we thank God again for our sister, our sister, sister, Serena James. There's some very fine, anointed ecclesia here, and I don't want to mess up, but we have some old friends, the Frasers and um, baby sister and my God, Tremaine and, and uh, a sister from uh, Chicago and so many others and Dayton. And, uh, God is just a good God. Would you reach over and touch somebody and say, oh, God has just anointed you and blessed you and thank God for you. Look at him in the face and just say, thank God for you. Come on, tell him again, thank God for you. He's a wonderful savior and we love him. There's a wonderful anointing <clears throat> in this house. And I was jealous of my sister because she's been here and joined the conference while we've been hitting the books and I, she came in last night with the afterglow all on her. Before she left, I told her I'm extremely jealous and uh, I really don't like that you get the chance 
to go and enjoy yourself and I have to work. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, we'll bring you back the tapes. <laughs> Thank God for tape ministry. <laughs> But I heard last night God showed off in this. Now can you just give his presence a praise? Come on, put your hand. <laughs> yeah. And those of you that just enjoyed the word of God, come on, give him some more praise. Huh? And if you had a chance to stretch out in the worship, come on, give him some more praise. And if God just what your soul needed. Let's give him some more praise. Ah. <laughs> Saints, God can do in a little while what physicians, psychologists, sociologists, friends, neighbors, families cannot do. All it does is just take a moment in his presence. And they came in and why God, you could just see and then we just heard it and I just got more envious and I said, God, you just help us. Give me the tapes. I asked her, I said, well, did you go to the bookstore? It was closed. I said, mm. yeah, right. Okay, we'll get the tapes. But God is doing a great thing in this Woman's to Woman's conference. Uh, there are some great preachers sitting over here and some of them are our sisters in the gospel. And um, we give honor again to a, a very long time standing preaching woman of God. This woman right here on this end. Have y'all ever heard this woman preach and teach? <laughs> Did not want to overlook her. She's an outstanding woman of God and I love her. I have a word from the Lord and um, I'm going to ask you to, I feel very comfortable by the Holy Spirit and I'm going to ask you too to just let me be me, all right? I'm gonna uh, ask you to get ready to turn to your Bibles, but uh, my sister works with us in the tape ministry and she brought some cassettes and uh, some videotapes with her and they're uh, somewhere in this spacious, wonderful place. They're, they're somewhere here, but uh, she brought several cassettes and also videotapes with her and I'm gonna ask you to take them with you, please. It helps us to continue to get the gospel out and it also um, ministers life. If there's someone that you know that's in your family that has been backslidden and has been backslidden for some time, there's a tape out there on that table that's called, a place called hell. It is a clear, picturesque, scriptorial based message but it is picturesque so that they can see it. It's descriptive. So if you will get that for them, at least they can make a clear choice on choosing heaven or hell. You see what I'm saying? Uh, let us not go out of the world ignorant, but allow them the opportunity to make a clear choice and just say, hey, I picked you up something. Just listen, I think you're going to enjoy it. Just put it in so that they can hear. It's a horrendous place that was created for Satan and fallen angels, but it was never created for you or for I. And we don't want our loved ones to go there. There's another one there, it's called repent. Um, and that is the number one thing that has to happen in our generation. There has to be a consistent repentance so God can keep sending these waves of anointing and uh, be faithful unto death, praise ye the Lord, and so many others that are out there, but please, by all means, uh, go to the tape table and please uh, support ministry, and I know you do, but uh, I just want you to be able to get the gospel out there to someone and also increase your daily walk with the Lord. Um, I'm impatient to get to the word. Come on, shall we? <clears throat> Come on. Let's look at the Word of God, and I'm going to ask you, if you will, um, just for a few moments, if you go with us to Genesis chapter number 3. It's something that you already know, but we're going to rehearse it. <coughs> I've been experiencing just a little tickle in my throat since I've been here. Just a little bit of water, just in case. 
just in case. All right, when you have it, say amen. amen. And you know exactly where we're going, don't you? Genesis chapter 3, shall we look at evolution? When we look at Genesis chapter number 3, let's go to verse number 1 through 3, and then we're going to um, read uh, 5 and 6 and 15, all right? 1 through 3, 5, 6, and 15. Got it? All right. Shall we read together? Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yes, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of every fruit of the tree of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Five and six. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. Shall we stop there? Verse number 15. We'll back up 13, 14, and 15. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and doth, and dust shalt thou eat all of the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and thy conception in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. Back up in verse 16. And tell me, was the woman cursed? Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Is that a curse? And thy conception in sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be unto thy husband. Is that a curse? And he shall rule over thee. Is that a curse? Verse number 15, <clears throat> I heard your girlfriend. 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between your demonic seed and her righteous seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Can we say amen? amen? Before you sit down, just tell somebody the evolution of woman. Come on, tell them again. They didn't get it. Just say evolution. <laughs> sister. Sister, oh sister. We just want to share something with you that God has on his mind concerning you. And we're going to move right out of the way. But evolution is not from the conjecture that we were taught in school, nor from the annals of vain analysis after uh, we learned and studied so well under the Darwinian theory 
uh, dealing with um, kinds and species, and also dealing with Mendel's theory of genetics, dominant recessive genes. Um, we are speaking about the evolution of woman. Come on, just one more time, tell her the evolution. evolution. Tell her there's some changes going on. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be all right. Let's look at her and smile. Let's just tell her some changes are going on. Just, hmm? God spoke to my heart in prayer as we prayed about Lady Sarita and what God had placed in her heart for this time. And I tell you, it was some kind of prayer meeting in the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to rehearse some things that you probably have already heard, but I just need you to walk with us through it. The Holy Spirit um, is start thundering in my spirit. And those of you that really have a life with God, God is not a toy to you, but you have a life with God. And um, he wakes you up when he's ready to talk. When I was talking to him about Lady Sarita and uh, what she had on her mind and what he had placed in her heart for this particular time, he thundered into my spirit in prayer as we communion. He said, you're going to speak to the women about the evolution of woman. I said, oh, Jesus, the evolution of woman, Ex explain, explain. But the Holy Spirit began to speak into my heart so many things, so many things, so many things that are changing. But before you can effectively walk in change, you have to have the ability to assess where you already were, where you are, and have a good concept on where you're going. Sisters and brothers, we have walked into a wonderful time in God. Come go with me. When you look in the book of Genesis, most of the times, we approach the scriptures with preconceived ideas already. We have been lectured, we have heard orations, we have had sermons, we have had teachers, we have had mentors, we have had pastors, we have had friends who tried to pastor us. So we have heard the scripture. We have heard the scripture from so many diverse angles and we've heard a lot of conjecture, some ideology, some eisegesis, some good qualified hermeneutical exegesis. We have had to pick out of it all our own concept on how we perceive God. But this Bible, has its own concept of who God is. And it has to stay contextual. There has to be a pretext, a post-text to extract context. Sisters and brothers, for that reason, oftentimes we culturally approach the word of God. And with our culture and with our belabored social concepts, we come to the Word of God with a cluttered mind with preset ideas, answers. Before we read it, we already have our traditions in our mindset. This is the way I'm going to believe this because this is the only way I have been taught it. So. That's the only way I'm going to receive truth. So sometimes the truth is mixed with a lie. Sometimes the truth is mixed with dogma. Sometimes our truth is mixed with tradition. And sometimes our truth is just mixed with, I don't want to do it anyway. Huh? So when we approach this particular book, 
we see everything getting ready to happen. And when we look at chapter number one, we're ecstatic. Although when we get to school, oftentimes they want to put all of the time spans differently. And that doesn't mean anything, just clear, plain conjecture because they cannot change or alter the word of God. But we're happy about creation. But when we get down to uh, the sixth day and God says something wonderful, let us make man in our image and after our likeness and let them have dominion over. Now, that's the place that we are so that we can see where we were so that we can assess where we are now so that we can make sure that we're going in the right direction. Now, this is the creatorial Elohim process. Listen, 1 and 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them, them, say it with me, them. Yeah. Say it again, just let it roll right over your mouth and your teeth and Come on, come on, come on. Say, them. Uh-huh, let it hit right up in your palate. Come on, say, and let them have dominion. Say it, let them have dominion. Now, that's where we were, right? Where are we now? Hmm? All right. Now, this was God's perfect plans because this is what we really see in the preordained concepts of God. Uh, we are predestined, pre. It means before, before. He had already slated an idea on everything and has it patterned and locked down. So we are predestined. This is God's predestination coming into view. And God creates this thing and says, let them have dominion. So this is where we were and now we have to get somewhere, right? Now, most of the times when we look at that, uh, theologians want to bounce it back and forth, but you can't touch the scripture. It's there. You must deal with it the way it is. We cannot add or subtract from it. We must believe that this is eternal God word. In this, this is the creatorial process where God is pouring out his vision. His vision is coming out of him. Everything that was in God is coming out and it's being birthed. And it starts out in the beginning, Elohim uh, created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and chaotic and darkness covered it. And the Spirit of the Lord brooded and hovered over the face of the darkness and then God said, right? So now the creatorial process is happening. God is breathing vision. He is breathing everything out. He is creating. He is moving. He's doing all of the wonderful things that need to happen. Evolution starts here. It did not start with Darwinian theory or concept. There's nothing wrong with him reaching for knowledge or reaching to understand or to put definition to what he doesn't understand. But when you label something out of context, you throw off thinking processes. Sisters and brothers, the evolution or the movement of God, it just means to go in a set prescribed movement. So you see God going in a set prescribed movement. That's evolve, evolution, that's movement, that's process. It brings about change. So God is creating through the power of his word. So things that were, were not, are, and now exist because now they were the thoughts of God and now they're taking on visible, concrete handling. You can touch it, feel it, and see it. Where it was in God, it was the faith of God moving. I'm going to have, and I'm going to have a world, and I'm going to have a man, and I'm going to have a woman, and I'm going to have mountains, and I'm going to have trees. But it was all in the pre-conscribed thought of God. It was his pre-ordained thought. But, and I'm 
going to have a nation and then I'm going to have a holy people and then I'm, I'm going to have a royal priesthood and the holy all in him in him in him we live and move and in him we have our being you see just standing there with God in his godness and his essence of who he is in his omnipotence his omniscience his knowing everything yet he knew it all but his knowing had to become factual and his faith became fact he spoke it and there it was and that's why we can say now faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things evidence evidence the full proof that you can think on a thing and believe that thing to come to pass and God will bring it to pass huh come on just let me be me just let me be me okay Sisters and brothers, I promise you, when God starts speaking about this conference, he starts speaking about the evolution of woman. What he had in his mind for woman. And, uh, and, and most definitely when we come to these passages or the process of God taking off and emitting his thoughts and his words becoming his deeds, we see the manifestation of so many wonderful things. The process of a set prescribed movement, evolution. The process of a set prescribed movement of process of change in a certain direction constantly unfolding evolution 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 putting on and taking off taking off and putting on and taking off taking off. in the process of God-centered Christ-centered change evolving into what God already designed and deemed for us to be touch her touch him next to you and say mm-hmm God knows what he's doing a species, a race. There is a prescribed species and race that God intended for his women to be. Now, this is the outline, and it says that they would have dominion, male and female created he them, that they would have dominion, both of them would have dominion over the fish of the sea. And these are their territorial outlines of government, of authority, of anointing, of control in their destiny over the fowls of the heavens. So they were to control those flying things in the heavens, those things in the sea, those things on the earth. They were to control the cattle and over all of the cattle on the earth. The creeping things that moved across the earth and those things upon the earth. Sisters and brothers, God have already outlined that we are to reign. Come on, look at her and say, you're still supposed to reign. Look at him and say, still reign, reign, reign. But when we look at women in evolution down through the centuries, this gets all muttered and we don't know how it gets muttered, but then again we do. Now, chapter one, that was God's design, and because it's God's design, it's going to maintain that. Then we usually jump from chapter one, and then we jump to chapter three. And when we jump to chapter three, we miss something wonderful by not going backwards. But anyway, we usually jump to three, and then we say uh, that God said that the woman is cursed, and uh, because she is cursed, um, then she's supposed to be subject to childbearing and weep and sorrow and uh, her desire shall be unto her husband and her husband shall rule over thee. And then we put women right back into this mental subjugation and uh, she becomes forlorn because now this is way back in Genesis thousands of years ago but this scripture is taught it is it is taught with uh, uh, subjugation it's it's taught with duress it's, it's taught with uh, uh, you come down you come under you come under my feet you know it's it's taught to brutalize it's it's taught to twist and worm and control or to take you out of place and, and put you back in your place and I, I never found out what my place was but anyway you know just it take you out of a place why don't I say that and then put you in a place well whatever that place is that's made up by society now the unique thing about that is if we would have went back 
to chapter 2 and looked at what happened in chapter 2, it would happen, help us with chapter number 3. God is a mighty God. Somebody say amen. amen. Now, in the process in, in chapter 2, you'll see there through verses 21 and 22, and then God begins to declare as he talks to the woman, he and to Adam. Adam uh, starts doing something that is so wonderful here. And uh, the thing that Adam is getting ready to do is birth or give birth. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> some of you women have always wanted to know how can a man give birth well here it is the man begins to give birth because God is getting to ready to make him a help meet now God spoke it in chapter 1 didn't he it shows up in chapter 2 right and the man is the one that's doing the birthing Watch it. Come on. Come on. And as the man is laid down to produce what he needs to walk with him, one who can see eye to eye with him, God puts him not just to sleep, but deeply, greatly, he goes into a sleep. So now, when you look at it in so many different other scholars, and, and I like the way Brother uh, Advazini says it, but he pulled out this whole being of a person. But when you look at the scripture in its context, it talks about Adam. When you read the scripture, as Adam is getting ready to make sure that this is child or giving birth, watch. Watch the old Hebrew, the way it reads. It says, we are building and making, these are the same words they use for childbearing or birthing, okay? When you look at it, it says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs. Now, when you look at it, it's, it's not a rib, it's of his ribs, and when it talks about it, it talks about uh, uh, him b being birthing or put in the position to bring forth. Huh? Now, when you look at it, God is creating a nation or mankind or woman, uh, uh, this being, the feminine part, the feminine gender is pulled out of the side of Adam. So now this is natural birth. Come on, say amen. amen. This is wonderful because it's God's choice and in God's way. But now when you get to chapter 3, God has changed the formation of birth. Men were supposed to. <clears throat> Catch it. So now we move into abnormality. Come, come on. It came out of Adam. Birthing came out of Adam. He was the producer. Huh? Come on. He was the birth, the one that gives birth. Then when he gets what is birthed or made or the child or the woman that is birthed out of him, God sets it before him. He names. He names what came out of him. And calls it woman because she's bone, my bone, flesh, my flesh is on her. That's my flesh, that's my bones, that's my sinew, that's mine. It came out of me, you got it? Now, it's the same process that we see being reversed years later too. 3,000 years later, Jesus Christ has the same birth. It's coming out of his... Sisters and brothers, it's a very good point that our brother makes, reading different things, and then when you look at the scriptures, that, uh, that the birthing, the natural birth comes out of men. The abnormal birth. Huh? Come, 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 come. So now when we skip that to go to chapter 3, 
to use it as a scripture to bring women under subjugation. Sisters and brothers, when you look at the word the way it really says in chapter 3, then you can see the big picture, the big scheme. Look at it. Starts out in 3 and 1. The subtility of the enemy. He's got to do something. Adam is birthing. And he's creating something so powerful. They see eye to eye. The principle is we're any two or three. It is so magnanimous that's what's happening. Now he's got something that can look and reason with him, can catch what he catches. And when God talks, can join with him in it and produce and overtake a world that Satan had already set in his pre-constrived thoughts to rule. He's out of heaven. This is before Genesis 1.1. He is out of heaven. See the big picture. See it. He is out of heaven. He has no rulership. He's out of the choir. He's kicked off the team. He's not the chief ruler. So he needs something to rule. God didn't take his ability to rule. God didn't strip him of his authority. God neither stripped him of his, his giftings, his powers. He just kicked him out of position. So he doesn't have anything to rule, nothing to rule. I'm a ruler. No authority and I had big authority. Nothing to dominate and I am a dominator. I'm a rule this world. But God sets in two other people. And said, let us make man and let them have dominion. So he's still out of a job. The place he thought was going to be is still not going to be his. God gave that up too. So chapter 3 comes and said there's a spirit of subtlety and deception on the move. And he talked into one of those gifted, creative beings and said, can I borrow you for a moment? He beguiled the creature and the creature submitted to him and he ruled in his members. And he walked into the garden and started his deceptive trail of confusion. Watch it. What do you have to do to those who are ruling to make sure that you enslave them and rule them while they rule. You have to transfer what you have in them. You have to deduce them down out of their present state so that you can control. It's an old deceptive tactic he uses over and over and over again. When you want to transfer wealth, what do you do? You find out what their secret is and transfer. Transfer them out of their ability to create and control wealth and you move into that spot so that you can control. What do you do when you want to be at the top of the ladder and you're way at the bottom? You see how they work in the top of the ladder. And we call it a word and we network from the bottom to the top. When we get our eye on the position, then we discredit through deception, moving them out and stepping in. We preach to all of those around them deception and folly so that those that trusted in whoever was at the top starts losing confidence. Come, come, come. It's an old trick. These kids are at the top. 
I've got to get them at the bottom so that I can be at the top. That's chapter three. I need to be at the top so I can rule. So he goes to the one who didn't hear literally, he didn't go to Adam. Cause Adam's been meeting in the cool of the garden every day. Every day, Adam was nobody's fool. He knew exactly what God said. Eve, he translated to Eve. We're not gonna be eating out of that tree. Da, 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 my you know, God said that. Yeah, okay, fine. Total agreement. He went to Eve. Did God really say? He must move her from her place to get in her place. Sure, he said it. No, he's not a mean God. We can eat anything. We can eat anything we want to eat. He just told us don't touch the tree in the middle of the garden. Oh, he knows that you're going to be wise. If you do that, you just, you could be just like God. Like God? Just like him? Look what was her aspiration is. I want to be like him. Is that bad? It's not bad. I want to be like you. How often is we say, God, I just want to be like, I just want to be like you. I want to be like you. I want to love like you. I, I want to give like you. I want to be like you. He takes what she desires to be. I just, I just want to be like you, Lord. I want to be just like you. And he uses that to say, if you eat of the tree, you can be like God. Adam's listening to the whole dialogue and never says, baby. <laughs> you don't want to do that, baby. He never says anything. But we know he's with her because she eats of the fruit and gives it to her husband who is, the Bible said, with her. Now, what happens is God knows that they're out of position, out of position, out of position. I put you in a reigning domain. I put you in a dominant, authoritative position and you're out of position. Out of position, whether you are little out or a lot out, out is out. Sisters and brothers, when you are out of position, out of the place where God sets you, you'll find out the confusion that you have to deal with the enemy is just too much for you to even bear. Because in the place that he sets you, he has placed you in a hedge where you cannot be touched. But out of position, you hit the enemy, hit you headlong. <clears throat> That's the reason why Job said, and except God moves the hedge, a serpent will come in and bite you. Sisters and brothers, God has set a hedge around the anointed, around those that he has positioned. Don't think that your position is to be taken lightly. God knows where he set you. That's why he says he sets us in the body as it pleases himself. When he sets you there, he sets you there with dominion, authority, so that you can reign and you are anointed to hold that position. But out of position throws everything else out of kilter. They are out of position. When they're out of position, you don't see him at the cool of the evening. Adam hears the voice but refuses to answer. Adam, Adam, where art thou? He has to call him twice. He never had to call him at all. He's out of position. He's hiding. He never knows what the word hiding is. I, I, I heard your voice and, and I was afraid. New word, never knew that word before. 
You learn new words, new definitions, new concepts. You are in contact with stuff that God never expected for you to experience because you are out of position. He said, who told you that? Where did you get that from? Somebody's telling you something. I never talk to you about fear and being intimidated and slavery and naked and subjugated and stripped. He never talked to him about those kinds of subjects because he was free and he was full of joy and he had peace and he had all of his faculties working. He was healed. He was whole. He never had to talk to him about sickness and death and think never because that was never in the prescribed thought of God for you or for me. God doesn't waste words on something he already knows he doesn't have in his mind for you to do. Sisters and brothers, because they are out of place, now starts the evolution. Their change, they're dying. They're in the process of change. And in the process of change, now Satan is in control. They are underneath, you see what I'm saying? God is the supreme authority you see the pros problem now when God says a thing down he's got to deal with all this all of this atmosphere in the cool of the evening it was just Adam yes yes father yeah now Satan Adam Eve God Adam it, 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 I think I hear him. I, I, I kind of feel something. I, he's got to deal with all of this. That's where you get chapter 3, verse number 15. He said, I will set enmity between your seed and her seed. Satan, since you did this, I'm going to set enmity between your seed and her seed. And that word enmity is hostility and hatred. Everything that comes out of her is going to hate you and it's going to snare you and it's going to be an opposing or an opposite tribe or opposite party. And everything that's coming out of him is going to oppose you and is going to be an opposite tribe or an opposite party. Sisters and brothers, can you imagine that the war is not, there's a male and female war. There's not a male and female war. This is a satanic war against woman. The battle, sister, the battle, please. The battle, don't get caught up in the social structures of this day and age. Talking about I'm a feminist and I'm this, that, and that. That's not where the battle is. Let's put the battle where it is. Isaiah 45 verses 1 through 3 says, I will give them strength who turn their battles towards the gate. Turn your battle towards him who's in your way. The one that's in your way is Satan. Turn your hostilities and your hatreds against Satan and watch him be defeated. You have the power to bruise him. You have the power to stop and step, move his steps and make him have a, 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 a gate that he can't seem to keep up with. It's right there in you. God has anointed you women woman to woman let me tell you something good when you look at the word of God in the process of this whole dialogue so now what Satan had to do because now he's the prince of the power of the air now what do you do when you want to subjugate a people now you have to turn out propaganda now what he's doing is he has to set propaganda in the atmosphere to turn up people who were once believing to unbelieving. Now, he's got to stop the producer, which is Adam. He's got to stop him from being a coupler and a handholder to woman. He needs to put a separation between male and female. He's got to divide to conquer. The only way you can do that is through propaganda. Those tricks have been used down through the years. How do you slaughter six million Jews? How do you do that? Through propaganda. You have to 
turn the poles of the decisions for life and death. You got to tell people that they are not human. Why? Because as long as I know that you and I are human, then I, there's no way. I have a conscience. I can't hurt you. I'm going to come back and say I'm sorry. I, I'm going to uh, apologize. You kill Jews by segregating them through process of re-education. You take masses of people and retrain them through educating them differently. You change their societal concept about a particular group of people. So what Hitler did was he start infiltrating propaganda in the schools. He taught them and showed them movies and, and start talking about they are the ones who are so wealthy and this is the reason why we're poor is because the Jews are our enemies. A lie. It's a lie from the pits of hell. But when you want power, you must strip those who have power and transfer wealth. Now, how do you do that? You started out with deceptions. How do you get Susie's man when he's really hooked on Susie? I I is that better? Can you relate with that? Huh? Huh? Well, you go the other way. You start dropping propaganda. Well, you know she can't cook. That's the y'all look good together, but you know she can't cook. I need to let you taste my pie. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to bring you some over. You start propaganda so that you can reverse the control and the power. So what happened in a matter of a few months, the country started changing their ideas and they kept deducing these people down till Finally, Hitler just had rats running through the alleys uh, uh, of the movies, and he said, these are nothing more than ravening beasts who carry infestations and disease. So now when people look at them, because uh, propaganda takes a while, now when people look at them, they don't see them as human. They see them as rats carrying infestation, disease, and pollution. <laughs> So what do we do with rats? We kill them, uh, uh, we pull them into gas chambers, uh, 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 we put them into fiery furnaces, uh, uh, and we make soap out of their bones and lampshades out of their skin. Mm -hmm. Sisters and brothers, you can only do those kind of demoniacal things when somebody keeps talking against what you already have as information. Men information is evil in the hands of demonic forces misinformation is evil when it is in the hands of demonic forces when you come to church you'll start looking at her different and him different because propaganda has been loosed out on a particular individual and you have to deduce them down to beast or out of the kingdom of a, a royal priest to it in the holy nation down to a kingdom of animals so that you can mistreat them. They're saying praise the Lord and you walk by them. Uh, you are getting in your car and they say praise the Lord sister and you drive off in a scare and you sit down at Denny's and run them down. Ah, uh, come on and something needs to be done with this girl. Oh, anytime Satan wants to transfer power he starts the process of propaganda and don't you be a party to it. Know that he's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. In the old covenant, it is called the halacha. The halacha is nothing more than a traditional law uh, uh, that they start just orally passing on down about women. Uh, women, 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 they're no good. Women, women, what are they good for? Look at the enemy talking to Adam. What are they good for? What are they good for? Oh, they're good for nothing. They're just good for nothing. You pass down the halacha. The halacha is one of the old Mesopotamian laws and traditions. Ah, the Jews had their Torah, and then they had their halacha. God had 
given Moses the Ten Commandments, uh, but the commandments was not enough, my brother. Uh, what did they end up doing? They had to interpret what God meant. Uh, you don't have to interpret what God meant. Uh, just say what he said. Uh, God will give his own interpretation. Uh, God will tell you what he means. Ask him. Uh, but now they're going to put their little ideologies and hook it on to the Ten Commandments. Uh, sisters and brothers, any time uh, your thinking outweighs what God has said, uh, you're on your way to vain propaganda. Uh, you're getting ready to move yourself out uh, of the dominion of God uh, and into a servile life controlled by devils. Uh, reach over and touch the sister or brother next to you and say, watch it. Uh, this stuff is dangerous. Uh, now they use this traditional thing and what they did this thing became more powerful than the Ten Commandments that's the reason why they got stuck in the wilderness sisters and brothers those commandments was God's oracle right to them all they had to do was obey that but when somebody says well I think God means watch it watch it watch it watch it the devil been talking and laying seeds somewhere They've been up thinking on how they can get out of doing what God says. And you've never seen Christians act dumb and, and, and ignorant in their mind like, I really don't understand until they get ready and they want to sin. You know, we come up with, I just don't know. Does God really mean that? Or oh, over there in the other, no, 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 baby. Just leave the word of God the way it is. If you're not willing to live it, just say, God, give me some more strength. Give me some more strength to do what you're calling me to do. But don't deduce this down like some ordinary magazine, like it doesn't have any kind of credence, like this is ebony or jet. Or, no, 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 honey. This will stand forever. Whether you or I live it or not his word shall stand forever shout hallelujah anyhow so these traditions kept holding on till it separated man from his woo man Huh? Now he looks at her differently. Now, when you get down to the centuries uh, where we get back to Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, uh, the enemy has worked out his program until woman is not even seen anymore. Uh, now she's back somewhere off the scenes. Uh, she's not counted in genealogy. Look at her. Watch. Watch. Come on. Come on. Come on. Uh, she has lost her place of importance. Uh, he said, let us create them. Uh, and let them have dominion but now she has nothing she's not even considered human uh, uh, and Adam begot this and that and no 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 she's not even named ah uh, oh, the women children not even named they lost their importance because Satan heard in 315 she's gonna be his arch enemy well, 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 well we just gonna fight we just gonna be some fighting people she gonna fight me I'm gonna fight her I'm gonna wipe her out of genealogy I'm gonna make sure I wipe her out of the law I'm a wiper out of every ordinances and then they started creating laws where the women were had no covering for them they could kill them bishop and there was no law to cover them they could take them in the back and bury them and not even eulogize them my brother because there was no law to cover them the Mohamian law would not cover them and when they looked at it they said oh my god we have no covering but God that's why you see a Hannah in the book travailing and crying and talking about if God don't help me nobody down here is going to help me sisters and brothers what this devil did was made an intercessor out of every woman because she didn't have a voice nobody would speak up 
for her. Nobody would protect her or defend her. She was not even seen. That's the reason why Moses has to go to God. Watch it now. He's got to go to God. It's sunk so fast, my brother. This devil from Genesis to Deuteronomy. You got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. Now you're closing the Torah. Now the Mishnah is the commentator to the Torah explaining what God's supposed to have said under these books. Now watch it. But time we get to the Dutros, to the explaining again of these young folks who God is because they're getting ready to go into Canaan land. Watch it. The daughters before they go in say, wait, wait, wait now. Our father is dead. Uh, but we want our own inheritance. Uh, give us what belongs to us. Uh, Hogla speaks out and says, uh, we be the daughters of Zelophehad. Uh, and we want our own inheritance. Uh, we don't want to be sniffed off to the side. Uh, like we don't count because my daddy had no sons. Uh, is that all that counts with God are sons? Uh, is that all God concerned about give me a son no no baby Moses said I can't find anything in the law I can't find it in the Torah and in the Mishnah and the Sephra in the Sephra I cannot find it in the commentaries I cannot find it among the scribes what do I do Moses turned and went to the tabernacle when he got there God met him at the door and when he stretched out and said what do I do he said the daughters of Zelophehad speak right give them what rightfully belongs to them and he said when you get back down there write this thing down as a memorial this ain't a joke I said sons and daughters shall prophesy they shall dream dreams they shall speak with new tongues shout hallelujah shout glory sit 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 sisters woman to woman this devil needs to erase you he needs to erase you off the map. Moses had to go down and make a law. He said, let this be written down and don't you forget it. Put beside it memorial. It shall be a memorial. They shall inherit. They are also inheritors of the promises and of the things of God. Sisters and brothers, so when we come to our particular time and age, we run past the Romans, Alexander the Great, and we still see the mistreatment and the handling of women as chattel. Uh, because Satan is fighting a war against women to make sure they become the very off scourgings of the earth. Ah, uh, we see queens sitting here and there, ruling and reigning, but we see in Israel, watch, their women are deduced down to almost nothing. We see worldly women on the scene, the Romans, the Phoenician women rising up to power. Look how intimidating that devil is. Well, she's ruling and she's got property. Why can't I? They refuse to educate their girls. They left them in the back. That's the reason why they never understood the Torah. Because they even had their scholars say, if you teach a woman the word or the Torah, if you teach them out of the book, you will be like lectures. It would be like uh, teaching a dog. What? The word of God? To waste your time teaching a woman about God is like wasting your time to teach your dog about God. The 
our scourging and the evilness that came down through history is because Satan needs to blind the woman. He needs her to run in the wilderness to find defense because he's coming after her seed. He rose up, tried to swallow them up in Egypt, but God made a way for their escape. He rose up again and you see him, Herod the Great, searching out to kill those from the cradle to the age of two. He's coming against her seed because kings and queens and masters and rulers have now been assigned to her womb. Watch it now. Adam, he said, her seed, her seed, her seed, her seed. It's her seed, it's her seed. Well, it's her seed, her seed. Her seed will be your enemy. Her seed, her seed, her seed. Her seed, Satan, will bruise your head and make you swim and sway. Make you lose orientation. That's why women, when they travail, Zion bursts. Pain don't shake her. Pain shakes most people, but what it does to a believer is it runs them right to Jesus. Because if you mess with me, I'm going to run where I can get some help. Ah, you don't have to stand with me. Just let me get 10 minutes before him. Let me cry out, and before you know it, angels in the heaven will be out to assist me. God will send the help and then that right early in my sixth trouble he knows where I'm at in my seventh trouble he will surely surely deliver me then you get them rising up like Deborah rearing back I don't need a courtroom I'll judge between the trees you don't have to make no seat for me then you got them raising up as deliverers because God is not at all prejudice he'll take a little girl in full nations took a little girl by the name of Hadesha and made her to save a nation sitting on a worldly throne ruling and coming across the court saying if I perish I perish but I'm going to see the king shout hallelujah shout glory sisters and brothers I want you to see something here in the heart of God, in the mind of God, is the seeds this confusion that seeds is bringing division of a multi-focused couple. You got them marrying at the altar in matrimony, but there's a difference in matrimony and holy matrimony. Matrimony is what the world gets involved in, but holy matrimony is different because that bride becomes representative of the church and that man becomes Jesus Christ and sisters and brothers God keeps giving us typologies and examples and Satan keeps culturalizing the world in confusion against us and we bring our tradition and our culture to church and we set up boards and set up all kinds Kinds of uh, executive orders, uh, but we forget that uh, the holocha is not ruling. Uh, we forget that the laws of God rule. Uh, that's why Jesus had to declare uh, in the New Testament. Uh, he cried out in Mark chapter 7, uh, verse number 8, for by many uh, you are bringing and laying aside the commandments of God. Uh, while you hold to the traditions of men, sisters and brothers.
brother's tradition is not all bad. When you look at tradition in a good way, it was good for Elijah in the book of Kings to hold to the tradition of the church coming against Ahab and Jezebel and slaying the Baal's prophets. Sisters and brothers, but when you look at traditions, which are nothing more than beliefs that are handed down from society to society, to its people, its customs, its words, its songs, its economics, its philosophy. Sisters and brothers, tradition, we cannot make a god out of it. Dr. Oral Roberts says it this way, never make methods your god, because god can come on the scene and change the method or the way he does things. Sisters and brothers, the Bible says it like this, there is new wine skins, but don't put old wine in new wine skins and likewise, don't put new wine in old wine skins. The two don't mix. Sisters and brothers, when we take tradition in the place of God's law and his word, then we are passing down a inheritance to these debutantes that they will have to fight through. Why don't we pass down the right tradition and tell them obey God rather than man. The Bible said in the last days I will pour out my spirit on the some flesh that Bible said all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy well I tell you now that's where we were but where are we right now right now in the decade of the 90s cresting to the 21st century oh holy Christianity we must take assessment to that woman in the past so that we that stand here on her shoulders can be appreciative for the subjugation and the suffering but we must not be her daughters that hang our heads in fear sister to sister woman to woman mother to daughter she died so that you could have it a whole lot better coming out of fields strapped with youngins on her back scraping cotton till her hands were bloody and her back was bent woman to woman sister to sister she was little lady in the White House looking for a way out but man kept her as a prima donna woman to woman she was Apache and because she was here first the propaganda was get off the land the Europeans have arrived woman to woman she was walking the corridors of England stripped some time of her own dignity because of her sexuality sister to sister let me tell you in this particular day that we live you've got to recognize something these women suffered suffered so that you could raise your head they pinned the poems ran underground railroads set captives free covered babies from screaming cause something told them there was something better than this they struggle in midnight fire camps hid their young under their bellies duck darts duck fire duck shots some of them raped some of them stripped of their identity not so 
that you can be demonically enslaved. It's time now to be free indeed. Not just free in our spirits, but free in our mind toward God. If it's in the book, it's mine. If he said it, it's mine. If he spoke it, it's mine. And ain't a devil in hell can stop me. Shout hallelujah. Shout glory. Sisters and brothers, please recognize here that devil's trying to defeat us, trying to make us at odds, but ain't no war here. We set our battle to the gates. So here we are today in our churches and we must, we must understand the pragmatic thought of the enemy is to still keep us separated. Oh, no, 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 it's not a man's world. It's God's world. Ah, uh, no, 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 it's God's world. It ain't a woman's thing. It's a God thing. God has set the pace in motion. But what we've got to do is be brave enough to pick up the ball and win against the powers of these demons. Women, whatever you do, don't stop praying. Why? Because the Lord told me to tell you. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse Verse number 17, the Lord spake unto Moses and said, tell them the year is changing and I'm going to send a spirit of release. You have been released. July the 20th, 1997. Hear me and hear me prophetically plain. God said, declare a year of release from the presence of the Lord. I want you to hear something now. He said, I'm going to give you land that you didn't own. Houses that you didn't build. Vineyards that you didn't even plant. This is our season and this is our year. He said, tell them this. They're in the evolution of it right now. This is not a word just to women only. This is a release to the whole of the body of Christ. Preach it, teach it wherever you go. We are in the year of release. The evolution has come. We have arrived into the kingdom for such a time as this. What time? Time to evict the devil. Read what it says. And you shall dispossess the inhabitants of your land. And you shall dwell therein. For I have given this to you as a possession. This wasn't just the sons. Sons and daughters. We have stepped into a release. Stepped into the time of jubilee. You said, well, it ain't 50 years. I ain't been bound 50. I'm just 23. Well, then Exodus chapter 12, verse 1. And it declares, and the Lord speak unto Moses and unto Aaron and told then verse number two, uh, this month shall be the beginning of month for you. Uh, I'm going to start you in a brand new year. Uh, God doesn't have to wait on December 31st uh, to start you all over again. Uh, he can step right into September uh, and say, this is your new year. Uh, why? The Bible said he's God all by himself. He does what he wants to do when he gets good and well ready to do. So see ya. See ya. Put your hands together and give him the praise. Then you'll see it again. Numbers chapter number 33. 
verse number 50 through 56. 50 through 56, he said, don't be afraid of them. When I set them before you, have no mercy on them. Put them out. Don't be afraid of them. Put them out of your possessions. Woman, you are in evolution. You should have been on property. You should have been debt free. You should have been at the top of the ladder already. Brother, you should have been the owner of a company by now. You should have been a millionaire by now. But yeah, this devil, this devil's been making you the tail when this Bible said you are the head. He's made you the borrower when you should have been lending money. He's made you have headaches when you should have been reigning in peace. You're working four and five jobs. Why? That's why God said, I'm cutting it off. I'm getting rid of the past. Where you stand presently is in the middle of a brand new evolution. God has decided to start you over again. You may have felt like the tail, but you gonna be the head. So say everything is set against you praying about this meeting the Lord said to me he said tell them as we stand together because we're closing sister the enemy has set so many laws against you you can be beat to death in your home and your your assassin can go free. You can be raped and brutalized and can be told to your face, you asked for it. Your children can be taken from you by their rules considering you unfit. You can stand side by side with your brother and he make $20 and you only make 13. <laughs> Satan has designed this to frustrate you. But he doesn't understand. It only makes us stronger. It has a unique way of squaring our shoulders and posturing us for greatness. Sisters and brothers, it only positions us spiritually as gracious and graceful. Instead of arguing, we run to God and say, oh God, oh God, have mercy. I see myself in your word, but I can't find myself in your church. Second class anointings. Same anointing, but the wrong package. They warned us about the demon of racism, but they forgot when we come to church to warn us about the demon of sexism. 
We're trying to pull the races together, denominations together, but we're not we're gonna pull the sexes together. Since we are talking woman to woman, I thought I'd just let you know what God said. It was the concern on his heart, but we have stepped into the year of release. Our brothers, our sisters, our mothers and our fathers, all of the saints together, we have stepped into a new evolution. So you're gonna see women doing stuff your society has never dreamed of. And you're gonna see our men doing things that our present day society has never dreamed of. Let me tell you prophetically what the Spirit is saying to the church. There's going to be great increase and favor that comes out from the presence of the Lord that happens so quickly at this time. You're going to be able to walk up to people and say, you just need to give me that. That's Exodus chapter number 12. And he said, because the Lord was with them, he said, ask them. And they'll give you whatever you ask. That happens in the year of release. Well, you need to give me this property because you need a tax write-off anyway. What are you gonna pay? Nothing. You need to give it. God told me to ask you because you need to give it. Sisters and brothers. You should have been debt free way belong now. Get out of debt. Get totally and completely out of debt. You know why? It's because God is going to send great increase to you. But the increase that God sends to you in this season, and listen good, is not for a new hat or a new dress. It's so that you can get out of debt because this vision the vision of the Lord and the vision in your house and the vision that your pastor has, it has to come to pass. It is already slated by Satan in statistics. He has done such a marketable job until most men and women only live out 10% of their vision. 10%. All their life struggling, struggling against the forces of financial darkness. It's not, it's not broke. God ain't broke. God ain't broke. It's, God ain't broke. God is not broke. But what the enemy does, he confuses you. He makes you believe you giving. A little brings you much. No. That's not in scripture. God needs a way to get money to you. And he uses your giving as a vehicle to get money to you. Some of you, five, five thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand. God is going to start talking to you about things because God is going to get money to you. Twenty-two percent of pastors in the United States of America tithe. Only twenty-two percent. Out of all of the churches, the thousands and the hundreds of thousands of churches in the United States of America, only 22% of them tithe. 22. As a result, the stats say 22% of the congregations tithe. So 78% of our money is held up, struggling to do vision, with only 22%. 22%. Everybody, that's the word. You have to tithe. And when you tithe, you haven't done anything. <laughs> tithe. <clears throat> the tithe, the Bible says, put meat in God's house. So now your house is still empty. 